Welcome to another RD Works Learning Lab. Um, today's a little bit of a, a mixed session. Hopefully we're going to come to some sort of conclusion with compound lenses, but as I say today, this may well be taking place over several days, so it might be a little bit bitty. Um, one of the things that I want to just start off with is to explain to you, I've done quite a lot of work already, and I've not had a huge amount of success. But I have had one small piece of success which I'd like to share with you. Come and have a look. Now, in my hunt for a long compound lens, I've come across something interesting which will help people with more powerful machines. I found a very good combination of lenses which works extremely well for photo engraving, as you can see. Here's the magic combination, and from the very few quick tests that I've done on it, it seems extremely good. Now it's got some very interesting properties. First of all, we've got two lenses in the standard compound lens nozzle. Those two lenses are both two and a half inch gallium arsenide lenses. Now the current compound lens is approximately 10.5 to 11 millimeter gap. This is 20 millimeters, which is a much better gap, but that means the risk of smoke getting back into the lens is a lot less. The chance of tarring up the front of the nozzle is much, much less, and it gives more time and space for air to flow across and carry the fumes away. The great advantage is, because it uses gallium arsenide lenses, it's not limited in the same way that the current compound lens setup is. The original lens is a two and a half inch uh, CVD lens, which is capable of taking maybe two or three hundred watts. And then we paired that up with this PVD one and a half inch lens, which is really only capable of taking maximum of 80 watts. So if you try and use this on a more powerful machine, there is a risk that you could damage that part of the compound lens. Now, you don't need to use it at high power to get good results. This is a much less vulnerable setup if you have a powerful machine. You can use it for cutting as well, and it will cut quite nicely. Now, in the previous lens work that I've done, we managed to find a combination, again, with gallium arsenide lens, which happens to be with a single lens, we could achieve 14 millimeters a second cutting this 10 millimeter poplar plywood. That's the basis upon which I'm starting to move forward because I need to improve on 14 millimeters a second if we're going to show any great advantage for a long focus compound lens. Now this information may well contravene everything that you already think you know about lenses, i.e. If you have a two inch lens, you can't use a two and a half inch lens unless you've got a lot more power. All of these, one and a half, two inch, and two and a half inch, and the four inch lens, they were all done with exactly the same power on this machine. So what it is clearly showing that as we look down this list, you get better cutting as you increase the focal length until you get to a four inch lens where all of a sudden it starts to drop off. So it would appear that a two and a half inch lens is the most efficient lens that you could use on these machines, regardless of the power that you've got. This is what I'm working on to start with this material to see if I can find something that gets us beyond 14 millimeters a second. Well, at the moment I've hit a brick wall at around about 16 millimeters a second, and I'm still looking for something that gets me better than 16 millimeters a second. So I'll carry on with my work and I'll come back and report to you later on. Okay, now look, I've got all my I've got all my numbers here that are guide numbers that I did with my little light bench. And for example, I've got a combination here at the moment which has got a seven and a half inch lens in this end and a four inch lens at this end. And I think to myself, look, here's a quick way of trying to find out roughly where the focal point is. So I could look through here. And it's focusing up about there, which is what? Maybe 40 millimeters. So we'll just drop this in the machine. 
and put it towards the top and we'll do a quick check with the pulse button set at 15% no ah we're getting there it's there so that's the best part of 60 mil, not 40 mil with extension on it. Because the closer I can get the air assist to the work, the better. That looks pretty small, that's probably about as good as we're going to get. So this is a long way from any prediction that I had. Lots of smoke coming up, that means it's not going through. And absolutely nothing on the back. I mean bear in mind I'm trying to beat 16 millimeters a second which is the last time I spoke to you. Well I have got to 17 but I've got to 17 with a huge variety of different combinations. Now there's one common factor here at the moment which is SZ and SZ basically means I've got uh, S which is a four inch lens, Z which is a Chinese PVD so that's a four inch Chinese PVD F means it is flat side down so that's the first lens four inches flat side down plain O convex and then we've got these other combinations here which we've got PX P which is a 1.5 inch lens would you believe and X is gallium arsenide so we've got a 1.5 gallium arsenide teamed up with that and we're able to get 17 millimeters a second equally QX Q which is a 2 inch lens and X which is a gallium arsenide again so 2 inch gallium arsenide was able to provide me with 17 17 I mustn't ever lose sight of the fact that once upon a time we were able to use a gallium arsenide Plano convex lens, two and a half inch, and get 14 millimeters a second cutting. So, here we've got exactly that again. Two and a half inch lens, gallium arsenide. Let's verify that we can get the same sort of results again, because since then I have changed this tube. There's very little difference in power. So we've set this up to focus and uh, we've got we're running at 14 millimeters a second which is the fastest we could run with this single lens previously we've got ourselves a cut it's just about through that's just on the limit of what I would call cutting so it did just about push out okay we verified that this machine can replicate what I did before, 14 millimeters a second. Now, what I'm now going to do is to verify that I can get approximately the same result with a single pulse. So there we go, I've got a single pulse there. And yes, it has just about come through. Now I know that that has set to 160 milliseconds. I'm going to change that to 200 millisecond pulse now. There's a 200 millisecond pulse that's just come through. So my point really here is I've found a slightly quicker way instead of take, doing a burn test for every single combination like this, I'm actually going to try initially testing the power with a single pulse because if it doesn't make it through with a single pulse then it's not going to beat 14 millimeters a second. I'm looking every which way to see if I can make this selection process quicker because it's very very tedious. Now here is that two and a half inch lens. I've been using this for quite a few of my experiments and one of the fears that I and one or two other people have expressed is that by firing another lens at this lens means I'm going to 
focus the energy to a very high degree onto the surface of this lens. In other words, there's a risk that I might be exceeding the energy density of the lens. Well, I thought that this gallium arsenide lens would be the ideal lens to put at the bottom of any compound arrangement because it has supposedly a very high resistance to energy density. Well, the lens itself might have a very high energy density resistance, but what I'm going to show you now, if I can catch it in the light right, you can see that there is a damage spot right in the center of that lens, where it looks as though I've actually burned off the anti-reflective coating. Now, I've just been using this lens to show you that, you know, it works still okay, and it's able to cut at 14 millimeters a second, but it does show you the risk of focusing too much energy onto the center of this lens. So that tends to limit, if you like, some of the combinations that I've tried and tested because of the risk of damage to the lens itself. And at the moment, I'm doing all sorts of combination tests. Many of them I'm not recording because they're just not viable. You know, some of them I've, I've recorded it and said they're, they're not viable, but the most that I've been able to find is 17 millimeters a second with all sorts of combinations of lenses. So it's almost as though I've hit a, a power brick wall. I don't know whether that's true or not. I'll carry on working and see what we can find. So let's take another look at one of my red beam test results. So that's the combination there with a spacing of 65 millimeters between the lenses and this looks to give quite a long focal depth. Okay, that's what it says. That is potentially a good combination. So I've set that combination up in here. Let's go through the test procedure for it and we'll find out approximately where the focal point is. No, I'm going the wrong way. It's lower than that. It's quite a big spot size. So that's a long way down there. If I put that nozzle on there, it's still going to be seven or eight millimeters below the nozzle, maybe even 10 millimeters below the now, nozzle. The lens is right quite close to the end here. I'm going to take that clamp ring out and I'm going to clamp the lens in with the nozzle. I'll take a nice clean corner and remember my little test? Pulse. Mm, well, <laughs> it's quite a big hit on that side and it's just about come through on that side. So yes, there is sufficient power to burn through there, but will it work at 17 millimeters a second, which is my target at the moment? With that much smoke coming upwards, no. And sure enough, nothing. So that is absolute rubbish. But we've got exactly the same setup here with a 90 mil spacing between the lenses. That says it's potentially quite, got quite a good focal range on it. We should make 17 millimeters a second, but look at it. It's just far too close to be practical, but let's try it. We'll put some air on, see if we can protect the lens a bit. Well, just as I thought, look, it's a very thick cut. The fact that it's brown around the outside tells me that it hasn't cut through. And sure enough, it hasn't cut through. So after all that effort, another rubbish one. Right in the center of that lens is a little black spot. This is a seven and a half inch lens, which I've been using at the bottom. So I've been focusing down onto that lens. And again, it looks as though the very high power density that I've been focusing onto that lens has damaged the coating. 
yeah, we're into quite dangerous territory here as far as lenses are concerned. I'm very lucky because these lenses have been gifted to me by Cloudray. So they don't owe me anything. This is all for experimental purposes, the whole point of the exercise. But it does show we've got to be very careful about how we use these lenses and how we focus down. That tells me that really I can't use the 7.5 inch lens at the bottom of the stack. That 7.5 inch lens has got to go at the top of the stack so that when it focuses down it doesn't produce a very very small focused dot. We would need some compression but not a lot. And so what I'm going to do now is quickly I'm going to drop that 7.5 inch lens into this very special short lens holder that I've got. There we go, two and a half inches from the lens to there. This is a seven and a half inch lens. Now I'm going to leave my pulse set at 200 milliseconds and we'll see what sort of results we get. So basically what that means is anything from zero spacing to maybe four inch spacing between the lens, the top lens and the bottom lens, I'm staying within a reasonable power density there because that's about three millimeters diameter and I don't think I'd want to go much more than that. That really helps to define the limits of what we can do with this setup. So the first decision that we've really made is we must stay with the seven and a half inch lens top of the stack. We've got to take a look at this with a slightly different perspective now. We can afford to have a seven and a half inch lens at the top of the stack because we're only going to get at the best a three millimeter spot at the bottom which is absolutely the limit I would suspect of the energy density that I want to compress it down to. So we've only got combinations of different lenses that we can put on the bottom with possibly shorter distances between them. So we're beginning to limit the number of possibilities that we can go hunting for. The one thing we can't have is basically a 4 inch lens at the top here. Because a 4 inch lens is so close to being down to a nearly a focus at this point here that we will have very very high energy intensity onto the bottom lens which is why, how I think I've damaged my other lenses. So we've got to go through and look at the results that I've had so far and try and work out what is doable and what is not doable. I mean, for instance, S is a four inch lens. So really we cannot include four inch lenses in our equation. So I've got to take all those results out. And look, all of those results are 16s and 17s. Bad news. S, S, R, which is a, a two and a half inch lens. Well, the only reason I got away with that is because the separation between them was zero but that really didn't give me a very good result 16 15 and that's the one that I think I chose for demonstrating the Fox that was basically a very good spot size so this T here 16 T 17 so hey we've automatically reduced quite considerably some of the options that we can go looking for. So it looks as though we're stuck with 17 millimeters a second at the moment because I can't find anything better than 17 with a T at the bottom, which is the bad news. That's the sort of thing that's going to damage that TY lens. Finding out that I can damage the lenses quite easily has forced me into this complete change of direction. I'm now stuck with having the seven and a half inch lens on top and what I'm now going to do is to go back through my lens data that I had before and this is the first one that I'm going to do, the one and a half inch lens. So I'm putting a one and a half inch lens underneath a seven and a half inch lens and what I'm doing, I'm using a fairly long separation between the lenses. It, it really depends on how far the, uh, the focal distance comes out in front as to how I can mount the lens. So there's typically sort of a 70, 80, 90 millimeter spacing here and then we've got roughly a 30, 40 spacing here, so half the spacing. Previously when I did test results uh, with this 10 millimeter thick poplar plywood, 
this was the result these are the results that I was getting for various types of lens and configurations for a 38.1 or a one and a half inch lens so I've used these on the surface focus numbers as a basis for comparison so with the with the big separation what I did I was able to get these numbers here 15 18 etc etc and then I changed the lens separation to a smaller number and got these results now at the end of the day what we're really interested in is trying to find the fastest possible cutting speed from any configuration and when we look for instance at this one here what we, what we find is that there are four possible results that we got we got 13 millimeters a second 16 millimeters a second 17 and 18 well obviously we're after the fastest one and the fastest one happened to come out with a quite a long separation between the lenses so how does that 18 compare to what we had before which was eight what I've then got is this comparison across the bottom here which is the percentage improvement now if you're unscrupulous about how you use numbers and percentages you can tell all sorts of lies um, I've tried to keep it very simple here and there's a little explanation underneath each one of these that explains how I've done my calculation but it's very simple really what I've done if I divide 18 by 8 I've got roughly two and a quarter or 225 percent improvement well no it's not a 225 percent improvement because I started off with eight millimeters a second to start with so my improvement is really only 10 millimeters a second but it is 10 millimeters a second improvement which is more than double the eight that we started with so in reality what I've got is 125 percent improvement okay so yeah that's still double the speed which is more than I was expecting now when we come to this one we've got a strange set of conflicting numbers here on the one hand the biggest and best cutting speed is this one at 19 millimeters a second and in terms of percentage gain we only show 90 percent but hang on look if I use this one six millimeters a second and I compare what that does which is 18 millimeters a second I've got a 300 percent gain no 300 minus 100 which is 200% gain so technically it looks as though this one is a much better result than this one this is the point I'm trying to make about percentages you can get the wrong impression with percentages in reality we're after the fastest possible cutting speed so why would we choose 18 over 19 doesn't make sense so what we're really interested in is these numbers that are ringed in green, the fastest numbers that we can possibly get, the fastest physical cutting speed, not the percentage gain. Although the percentage gain is very useful, and here we look, we find we have got exactly that. We have got a real gain of from six millimeters a second up to 18 millimeters a second. That's quite amazing. So we've got a 200% gain there and on this one 125 so these are pretty interesting results and this is only the one and a half inch lens so what I'm now going to do oh and I've got one more set of results to do here for the gallium arsenide lens so I haven't completed this one yet okay so what I'm going to do is push on and do the same sort of work for the two inch two and a half and four inch lens and then we'll come back and we'll do a bit of an analysis of the results that we've got and see if we can generate some patterns it's very early to say at the moment but when you start looking at this you say well hang on it looks as though in general we're getting better and more consistent results with the bigger separation of the lenses rather than this short one we've got this exception here but the difference is pretty small look 18 and 19 so it's giving the impression that maybe we can get these results probably from a standard lens tube in some way so we might not need anything special we seem to be sitting at around about 18 millimeters a second regardless of what lens type we are using so this is all good news after several days worth of work i have
have to probably admit to making a bit of a mistake earlier on in that although I checked to make sure that the new tube was approximately the same as the old tube it turns out not to be the case. What we've got here are my four basic lenses inch and a half, two, two and a half and four. Now what this chart shows is we've got zinc selenide Chinese style PVD, zinc selenide USA CVD and gallium arsenide and for each one of these we've got plano convex flat side down and flat side up, meniscus flat side down flat side up, the same here plano convex meniscus plano convex meniscus etc. Now there will be some of them that are missing because I don't have the lenses. But what we've got here is black numbers and red numbers. Now the black numbers are the numbers that I derived when I did my previous lens testing using the 60 watt EFR tube. And those were the numbers that I initially started to compare the results with. Well look, I've got 16 millimeters a second here, 18 millimeters a second, compared to six millimeters a second that I was getting with my EFR tube. So that's like 300%. Well, actually, it's a 200% gain. All right, so so that's that's an amazing improvement. But of course, it's not based on reality. And now these are the results that I'm getting from my new tube. And they are significantly different and better than I was getting from my old tube. Okay, now we'll come back to that issue in a minute, but we'll just take a quick look at the results. Okay, so I've gone from 13 to 18 now. And what I've done, I've highlighted certain numbers in here because they would be the numbers that I would want to choose and concentrate on. And okay, we've got one here, 19, that could be up there at 18. In other words, it appears that for a one and a half inch lens, most of the benefit could be had by having a fairly long distance between the two lenses. Here's the two inch set. Haven't got as much data on here, but again, look at the numbers, 18, 18, 19. So we've still jumped, we've still hit a wall here at 18 or 19 millimeters a second, regardless of what the single lens was doing, which is down here. Again, we've got a rather interesting sort of situation, which is where I got my original data from. Look, we've got 12 and 11, 10 and 12, 12 and 11. So there is very little difference between these numbers for a two inch lens. And that was what misled me when I first looked at these. I thought, well, you know, there's, there's nothing seriously wrong with these comparisons. Let's go to the two and a half inch lens. The, these are much more erratic. We're not getting so much of a pattern here, but all of a sudden you've got this 13, 15, then you've got this one 17 and 16. It's a zinc selenide meniscus, which all of a sudden has got a dramatic improvement. Okay, but again, if we look down here, the best results that we're finding are about 18 millimeters a second, the best cutting results that we can find. And now we'll take a look at the four inch lens. The black results, 11, 14, 16, 15, 17, that's a big jump, but 16, 15, 13, 14, 11, 14. I mean, these are again, reasonably similar to what they were before, but just a little bit higher. Again, we're not talking about huge percentage gains when we look at the numbers across the bottom here, but we're still faced with this same number, 18 millimeters a second. That's as fast as we can go, regardless of what lens, what orientation and what material we're using. This is rather a strange situation. Now, from my previous work with lenses, where I did these patterns before, established that 
basically a two and a half inch lens was probably the best cutting lens that you could come across. And in general, that is still true. We've still got our single lens here, 13, 15, 17, 16, 15, 11, 16. Well, we compare that with a four inch lens. We've got some 17s, some 13s, some 15s. Although I have to say that the zinc selenide four inch lenses are actually probably pretty good. So <laughs> these are the cheap lenses in a four inch variety, which as I said, very originally, this was a puzzle to me. Why it is that the spot size, <laughs> which gets a much lower energy density as it increases, actually cuts better than the more intense, smaller spot size. So the question we have to now ask is, look, we've got 18 millimeters a second, typically for our compound lens. That's the best that we can get. Is there any single lens that gets close to that 18 so we don't have to worry about using a compound lens? Well, the answer is I can see at least two combinations on there. Look, we've got a CVD, 17 millimeters a second, and we've got a four inch, which in several places is able to get 17 millimeters a second. This is a, a more powerful lens. It, it can higher, handle higher rating. So realistically, this is the one that I ought to be focusing on as a single lens and saying, well, look, why worry about the complication of a compound lens when we can get similar good results from a single lens? Now I've got to test this particular lens again and again and again on different materials to see whether or not this is actually an outstanding combination. As I pointed out to you before, we've got some big differences here between the black numbers, which is a 60 watt tube, and the red numbers, which is my SPT 70 watt tube. The huge difference in these values cannot be accounted for by 10 watts, but there's more to this than just an extra few watts of energy. How we started this exercise off was looking at the way in which energy passes through the center of the lens, remember. That was the whole point of this compound lens arrangement. We were looking to find ways in which we could pump energy through the central axis of the lens to get more efficient cutting. Well, I think there is a logical, and I'll have to admit accidental, explanation for this. And here it is before our very eyes. Now, this is a mode burn, a 10 second mode burn from my China Blue machine. It's a, it's a lens, it's a, it's a tube that's now nearly six years old. And it's still got this very lovely pointed profile. Okay, this is the 60 watt EFR tube that was on my light burn machine, the machine that we are now using for doing this test. So this was the beam that was used to burn the black numbers when we did our lens testing before. Now the reason why I changed away from that tube was because I could see that this did not have the same sharp point on it that this one had. For engraving purposes, photo engraving purposes, I was looking for a really sharp, crisp point on the beam. Call it sharp if you like, but basically what it means is I wanted intensity of light down the center of the beam. Remember, light intensity equals damage. The more intense the light, the more damage we do. So I swapped this out for an SPT tube that I knew had got a very, very pointy mode burn, light intensity profile. And here we can see it. The light intensity is really intense at the center and it's burrowing its way in very, very quickly. The more intense the light, the faster the damage. There's only 10 watts difference between these two tubes, but it's managed to burrow its way in twice as far as this one with an extra 10 watts maximum. So that makes no sense. But what it does clearly show 
is that the light intensity is a very important part of doing damage. The whole point of this compound lens was to take a wide beam, pass it through a seven and a half inch lens and focus the energy down to a smaller spot size before we passed it through a second lens. But hang on, I've automatically focused my light down to a very, very small area before it even gets near lens number one. So it's very likely that most of this very high intense light is passing right through the axis of lens number one and doing virtually nothing except projecting across to lens number two where it's passing right through lens number two axis as well. And that is why we are getting fairly consistent cutting results, damage, regardless of what the second lens is. The second lens is just passing the light right through the centre and we've got the same intensity of light. We must have the same intensity of light, otherwise we wouldn't be getting consistent 18 millimetres a second damage. That damage is the result of light intensity. If there's less light intensity, we have to go slower to do the same amount of damage. This CR70 has got such a wonderful intensity profile that it does not need a compound lens to get deep cutting. We've got a couple of 19s, but mainly all 18s, regardless of the lens that we put underneath that seven and a half inch. So, if I take away the compound, and I then look here, 17 millimetres a second, 17 millimetres a second, 17 millimetres a second, 17 mil. There are single lens that virtually get me to 18 millimetres a second without the complexity of a compound lens, purely because I've got the right intensity of light beam hitting the lens to start with. So, Although I'm probably going to go off now and do some more tests on here, what I'm going to do is I think I'm going to focus my attention on these single lenses here and find out whether or not I can get consistent results, cutting results, with these single lenses as opposed to these compounds with different materials. Well, after a sleep and quite a lot of thinking about what we've discovered with these results. Now my original goal was to try and get to a point where I could say take one of these, mix it with one of these nozzles, who knows which one it was going to be, maybe some lens tube extenders, a seven and a half inch lens, plus another lens. Seven and a half inch lens at the top and another lens at the bottom and bingo we'd be able to get something like anything from 50 to 100%, which was my goal, extra cutting power out of your machine. The data that I'm now coming across tells me that I'm on a fool's errand, at least with this machine, because the tube in this machine and the performance of the tube seems to have a much greater influence over cutting ability than the lens itself. If you have a blunt beam, you may well find that some of these combinations, a seven and a half inch followed by one of these mini lenses, will give you significant performance. The seven and a half inch lens will be doing what my tube is doing for me automatically, compressing the beam down to a very small, narrow foot. Now, it's not past unnoticed that this video happens to be number 200 in the series. Yeah. When I started, I was a youth. Here I am now, getting closer to oblivion. <laughs> I've made a lot of progress, but I still don't understand some aspects of this technology. So I've still got a lot more to learn. I was hopeful that this would be some crowning glory for number 200. 
It's certainly been eye-opening and it's taught me a lot that up to now I haven't understood about the laser beam itself and the way in which the laser beam reacts with lenses. Yeah, the essence of what we started out with at the beginning of this compound project is still there. We've managed to focus the energy right through the centre of the lens and get good cutting, extended cutting. I mean, who thought that you could get 18 millimetres a second cutting 10 millimetre thick material? OK, so it's soft wood. The compound lens is not dead for you guys. It might be dead for me. But I think I've demonstrated there's enough promise in compound lenses that you may well have to go out and spend maybe 20 or $30 on a 7.5 inch lens from Cloudray and then do your own experiments rather than spend maybe two or $300 on a brand new CR70 tube with a lovely, lovely pointed beam on it. So the project in principle has not been a waste of time. As I mentioned at the beginning of this whole compound lens series, cutting is something that takes place below the focal point. And what happens to the beam below the focal point is something that's very little researched and I think very misunderstood. So I think what this has done has given me the chance to put my effort back into trying to understand exactly what and how cutting takes place on these machines. And I think that's where we're off to in the next session. So until then, thank you very much for your time. And I'll catch up with you then.